Saturnino Herrán, Arte e Identidad. Una serie de cápsulas que presentarán diversas miradas en torno al legado del artista. Organizadas en colaboración con la Cátedra Extraordinaria Saturnino Herrán y alumnas de The School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Participan historiadores del arte, académicos y curadores que buscan reflexionar en torno a la vida y obra del pintor, así como su conexión con nuestra actualidad. Hello, my name is Daniel Quiles. I would like to generously thank Alive Pillado and Sofia Gabriel del Callejo for inviting me to contribute to this Catedra on Septonino Erran. I should note at the outset that I'm not a specialist on Erran, on Modernismo, or on Mexican art in particular. Uh, rather, I think I was invited to contribute to this workshop based on my teaching at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which engages Latin American art in transnational perspective. That's very much where my comments are coming from today. I'm inspired by the model set forth by the curator Luis Vargas Santiago in the wonderful exhibition Emiliano Zapatas Después de Zapata, which I had the luck to be able to see in January of 2020, just before all of our lives changed. The curatorial model that Luis took up for this exhibition featured this notion of what he called Greater Mexico. So uh, the idea of Mexican art, Mexican, the Mexican artistic tradition as something extending beyond the official geopolitical borders of the country, and indeed extending to Mexican-American communities in the United States, and to what many call Chicanex art. So this would be the notion that the Mexican diaspora, as it's based in the United States, should be taken seriously as an artistic tradition in its own right, and also may present opportunities to retroactively consider Mexican art from the past in terms of the influence that it's had and as a way to trace the shifting coordinates of nationalism, national pride, uh, symbols around indigenous tradition, conceptions of race, and so on. And I think that uh, Erran's work in particular, his Nuestros Dioses, incomplete <laughs> mural project, which is the, the work I'm, I was thinking through uh, for, this, for this contribution, I think you know, that, that could be a, an interesting way to draw more of a, a rhizomatic line from Erran. Uh, so again, this is not really my scholarship, which does temp try to trace specific historical connections in uh, fairly limited locales, here I'm, in a way, letting my thinking cross borders, as it were. So what we're looking at is a mural mosaic, mosaic mural in uh, Chicago, where I live and work. An important aspect of many Chicano murals is that they are not necessarily celebrated as masterworks. They are not isolated or placed in any kind of autonomous viewing situation. Rather, they continue to function as they were originally intended as facets of a neighborhood, components in urban space, not necessarily just decoration, but also um, maybe what we could call educational opportunities. They tend to have symbols, stories, f historical figures that are meant to be instructive, edifying to uh, the Chicano community that lives there. And so this image of Cuadlique clearly derived from the sculpture, the excavated Mexica sculpture that is uh, presently in the uh, National Anthropology Museum in Mexico City. 
And here is a different example of Kwadlikwe, um, earth goddess as identified here. A variation on the iconography, at least that we get from the sculpture, while the head is still comprised of two snakes that are spurting out of the decapitated goddess's um, neck. The hands, are, the hands and arms are extended, which they are not for the sculpture. They are holding the sun and the earth. Um, there is still a reference, particularly in the right hand, the right wrist, to the, the idea that the hands have also been chopped off with snakes emerging from Quadlique's body, but we also see fists. Quadlique is giving birth to Tlaloc, the rain god, which is not uh, a, a part of the iconic sculpture. And in a beautiful detail in, a, in the bottom panel, at the bottom of what is actually a highway overpass, you can see the snakes of Quadlique's skirt. That's actually literally her, the translation of the Nawak name, um, snake skirt, <laughs> um, they're kind of undulating within a, a yellow background, right? Like almost in a, a sort of abstract space. So this is quite literally a free variation on familiar nationalist iconography for Mexican identity. And again, we're looking at a highway overpass. This is part of a kind of shared public space that's been identified, right, as a, a Chicano park, Chicano park murals. Um, the mural just in front of Cuatlique uh, makes reference to uh, junques, which are like junk shops, which some people in the neighborhood, and this it's actually represented below it, protested against. They felt that there were too many junk shops in this area of San Diego and that it was... Um, uh, bespoiling uh, the, the, the residential aspect of the neighborhood. Um, Schiffer Goldman, the art historian, has argued that Chicano murals really appeared in two phases, that one set of murals early on made reference to indigenous and nationalist symbology, while the next tended to focus more on everyday life in the United States for uh, people of Mexican descent. I would argue the Chicano Park murals are a, a mix of these two. Um, they don't seem to privilege one or the other, and they, they're around 1977, 78, so this is really the moment where many of the best-known Chicano murals are, are painted, although the tradition continues today. Who are Chicanos? Uh, as many of you probably know, Chicano, the Chicano community in the United States is the result of multiple waves of migration throughout the 20th century. Of course, the United States as a geopolitical entity um, uh, extracted a, a, a huge quantity of land from Mexico in 1848 after the Mexican-American War. And really, it's throughout the 20th century with uh, persistent demand for labor and so-called guest workers that uh, Mexican uh, Mexicans arrive in the U.S. Uh, in, in, in some cases, they're able to stay and build their lives there, but there are also repeated waves accompanying each wave of immigration with xenophobic deportation. And one of the earliest and most scandalous of these was right around the Great Depression, 1929, when many of the people who were returned of, of some million uh, people of Mexican descent were already U.S. citizens or had been born in the U.S. Um, so this is a reminder that the Chicano community is a community born of struggle, defined by struggle, defined by labor, exploitation, labor that no one else wants to do, that's underpaid. They are, as a result perhaps, uh, adept at self-organization. There are profound traditions of activism and labor organizing uh, that, that emerge in the Mexican-American community, such as the National Farm Workers Association, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, et al. Here's some of the visual culture involved with that. There are late 60s manifestations of these kinds of groups, including uh, the Brown Berets, who were closely influenced by the Black Panthers. 
Um, so that was a development, this emergence of the Chicano movement, as it was called, the struggle against the Vietnam draft, which was particularly destructive for that community. And uh, crucially, the concept of Aztlan, um, an imagined nation, um, a nation that would be understood as reconstituting the seven states in the U.S. that were taken from Mexico, but almost treating that group of states as its own country, um, not Mexico, not the U.S., but Aztlan, a kind of homeland, a missing limb for a community that feels marginalized, that feels dispossessed of its land. Uh, it's very much uh, a land claim, right? Some of the rhetoric in the Chicano movement is worth paying attention to because I think it returns us to the moment immediately after Saturnino Herrán passes away, and I believe 1918, when José Vasconcelos devises what he calls the uh, cosmic race. Uh, if you just read the, the passage I've highlighted here, this reference to bronze people, to a sort of um, uh, idealized brown, right? Uh, it, it, it hints at the notion of miscegenation that was so important to Vasconcelos. Of course, it also, and it, and it links that racial claim with, again, this, this claim to territory, to Aztlan. In that way, it's a, it should remind us that the Chicano movement, Chicano murals, do have connections to Mexican modernism, both this official rhetoric of cultural minister Vasconcelos, as well as artistic traditions that come from the legendary muralists like uh, Rivera Siqueiros et al. In this constellation, Erran is a particularly interesting figure. Nuestros Dioses is a kind of planned triptych. Of course, it's never finished. Instead, we have uh, one oil painting and several drawings and charcoal and crayon that give us a sense of what this uh, so-called decorative frieze would have looked like when finished. And it's important to point out that, that Erran was proposing a different conception of race than Vasconcelos. I think that's safe to say, because all you have to do is look at this organization to see that on either side of the Cuadlique, there was to be uh, indigenous subjects and Spanish. The indigenous subjects at hand painted very much in the manner of early indigenism in the Americas, by which I mean it wasn't just Mexico. This is the Ecuadorian artist Camilo Egas, who, much like Erran, adapted uh, Art Nouveau style to represent indigenous subjects in a, in a feminized way. So this is, of course, a continuation of 19th century Orientalism, which portrays a brown, exoticized other as weaker. And so all of this colonial, uh, colonialist ideology that one race would be dominated by the other is sort of buried at the level of representation. The only moment for me of explicit hybridity or, mis or miscegenation, if you like, in Erran uh, would be this um, transformed Cuatlique, where the um, crucified Christ is quite literally superimposed upon the um, earth goddess herself. So um, if the earth goddess is in some way representative of uh, sacrifice or is literally in the process of being sacrificed, Christ's blood sacrifice is sort of it almost seems to be fused with that, right? The two symbols um, are syncretized. They are mixed together. But again, on either side, this dichotomy of race is preserved. Um, and, and perhaps it comes with a, as I was suggesting, uh, an implicit gender dichotomy as well. And this should uh, 
make us think of the archaeological and nationalist history of Cuatlicue as both a symbol, a potent symbol, one that, like Zapata, <laughs> um, does shift in terms of its meaning, but also, of course, a real object, um, an object that, that was excavated at the beginnings of modern uh, archaeology. It was quickly reburied, as I'm sure many of you know, out of uh, fear, I, I suppose, of what it, it, what it could do, uh, probably also just fear at a, a mode of representation that had not been glimpsed by many of, the, of those who uh, dug it out of the ground, but, but of course also fear of what, what indigenous Mexicans might have, how they might have responded, right? So in that, in that sense, a, a powerful um, object and one primarily known by copies, right? So you have all of these European explorers who are allowed to see it. Uh, the contemporary artist Mariana Castillo de Val makes wonderful reference to this proliferation of copies of Cuatlicue in her work. No solid form can contain you. She has this sort of um, to scale Cuatlicue, but it's tipped over on its back, perhaps in reference to um, the artist Francisco Agüera, who was given the very rare opportunity to see this, the sculpture's uh, underside and to record it. And ultimately, this drawing uh, circulates and is used repeatedly. It illustrates Humboldt's um, travels, among many other uh, under, you know, understandings of this sculpture, until in the 1820s, it's finally dug up again permanently and increasingly celebrated as part of a Mexican national tradition uh, as the icons of Mexica religion suddenly become those of an increasingly modernized Mexican nation. Uh, and then there's this migration of these physical objects as institutions gradually shift from a national museum to um, uh, what um, Porfirio Diaz called it the National Museum of Archaeology, Ethnography, and History, and then later the, the National Museum of Anthropology. Um, the, this, this sort of gradual movement from uh, national pride in, in the indigenous past um, to a, a sort of scientized objects, objects that are like presented in, in archaeological form, although even in the 60s, they remain icons, right, of, of modern Mexico. So the, and uh, scholars like Luis Castañeda have done a wonderful job of, of tracing the genealogy of, of um, Ramirez Vasquez and his production of um, Mexican identity in the 60s with the Olympics and World Cup uh, on the way. The place that I'll end my remarks and, I, and obviously I've gone sort of backwards <laughs> from the Chicano movement, but that was by design. Uh, I wanted to just draw attention, of course, to Rivera's take on the Cuatlicue, a different kind of miscegenation, if you like, between that ancient symbol and um, an, an equally idealized icon of uh, technology that Rivera becomes fascinated with, a stamping press at the Ford auto plant. Um, this is one of the earliest Mexican murals that essentially crosses the border and ends up in the United States, right? And it's Rivera already thinking in deeply transnational terms, so maybe in a way anticipating uh, where this language would go and the uses that it would have for the Chicanx community. Thank you.